Hey, hey, ho, ho, welcome to the show. Hey, 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 ho, ho, welcome. All right. Hey, Mad Pat. Yes, Grant's in the banana. How many of your fans does it take to change a light bulb? I don't know. How many fans does it take to change a light bulb? One to realize it's out, one to hold the ladder, and a third to ask their parents' permission before they touch a light socket. <laughs> Hey, Matt Pat. Oh, hey, Albert the Avocado. What's the difference between an Animax parrot and your theories on Undertale? <sighs> I don't know. What is the difference between an anti-vax parent and my theories on Undertale? At least when the parent fills their child's head with utter and complete nonsense, it's even will die before it realizes how stupid it was to believe such a terribly thought out position. <laughs> Game Theory, otherwise known as Gamer's Guide to Useless Information, makes you go, hmm, is a channel started by the main amigo himself, Matt, Matt Pat, Matthew Bat, who has a degree in theater or math or something like that. Matt's theories range from information to fun facts, such as how cool Mario is, why Pokemans are racist, how fast that blue guy from Sonic the Hedgehog is, and for a long time, that's where it stayed. Everyone was in awe of Matt's ability to take something no one cared about and make it so slightly more people would care about it. This was until... It. Happened. FNAF otherwise known as Fiends the Michael Association. 4. Was a game a bunch of people played that got some Jimmy's Russell when the characters made strange noises at him, but this was not all, dear viewer. These characters had a story, but not like a number one that you get from playing the game. You'd have to read fan articles to get the gist of it. I mean, if it worked for Mass Effect, and like the massive effect it had on the 40 and under bisexual community, Matt Pat was charmed from the start. BAM! A video of FNAF being an allegory for a mass shooting. BAM! A video about FNAF's throne guy is actually a purple guy. Bam! A video about FNAF was all a dream, and how it really shouldn't be because that's dumb. FNAF quickly became old Maddie's bread and butter, but then the theories around it started to spread thin. Fast forward that spreading to about two years ago, and MatPat gets invited to meet the Pope as part of a summit telling the Pope how cool this new internet thing is. MatPat was looking at the invitation, and accidentally glanced over the part that mentioned bringing a gift. Luckily, MatPat has his coveted pocket copy of Undertale, and gave it to him so he could get into the party and play musical chairs with the rest of the attendees. After the party, MatPat went home and told everyone how cool he is for being able to play pin the tail on the donkey with the leader of the Catholic Church. But when he mentioned giving him Undertale, the crowd went silent. Why? A distant voice echoed. MatPat, unprepared to defend his decision, leaves the room and begins working on his video, Why I Gave the Pope Undertale! making sure to capitalize Undertale, as well as adding an exclamation mark to make sure the ne'er-do-wells that doubted his decision would know his indignation. Fast forward to about a year later, and everyone just kind of sat there until they thought, Wait, why wasn't I invited to the Pope's party? I would have gotten him a better game than some crappy indie nonsense. Then they took to the internet, and began to reasonably explain why Matt Pat is dumb, and now he should have gotten the Pope Fall of New Vegas instead, because that game is cool super cool and super and awesome. Super and really awesome, and I really... Like, yeah. After this point, it started to become a trend in and of itself to dislike MatPat. People were dunking on him left and right, and he still wasn't responding to any criticism people were giving him. Sure, there are some smaller controversies that are handled pretty quickly, like his TF2 vs Overwatch debate, or his For Honor video, but they were both handled by their respective communities. Channels were starting to criticize the entity of MatPat, and not just the thing that MatPat did. You started to have videos like, Why now hate MatPat? Why did the game theorists change? What happened to Game Theory? which were all tales about how MatPat and the Game Theory channel in its entirety has changed. After all of these intense critiques, MatPat was starting to feel the proverbial heat, so he decided to address the criticisms. Twice. Once by being really dramatic and sad about how much he loves Undertale and giving it to the Pope. Things and the hate that that video- And once by going on a live stream called MatPat Reacts to Haters and laughing about porn for an uncomfortable amount of time. I've actually never looked at- Porn. Naturally, after these intense debunkings, most of the truly Russian bot dumb faces retreated back in their 4chan holes to tweet about Donald Trump XD got him. No, but seriously, people just got more upset at MatPat after this, and it made him seem like much more of a petty person. I mean, he legitimately did the two worst things you can do when responding to criticisms just one after the other, so needless to say, MatPat wasn't looking too hot in the public opinion department. This leads into the point which I have coined, Transition Slut. The mid-2018s to 2019s were a prominent time for game theory detractors, 
Lawyer Guy says Game Theory Souls Analysis, Artist Guy says Game Theory Sales Fan Art, Indie Game Maker Guy says Game Theory didn't promote their game well enough. It was the Wild West for anyone looking to scoop a little Matt Hat branded promotion nuggets from the proverbial YouTube deep fryer, and while Matt still was gaining popularity as he always had, so were his detractors. It all started with little video about some crazy anime girls, as most problems do. In Game Theory's video about Doki Doki Literature Club being really buff, he used a trace asset of a character that was made by some crazy cat by the name of Childish M. This did not make Childish M very happy, so he took the local art enthusiast slash commentary maker Manga Common in his landmark video, <sighs> Art Theft That's Not a Theory Game Theory Rant. In the video, Common brought some of N's criticisms of MatPat's use of his asset to light, such as It stayed in the description that had using the sprite in major works, such as videos, altered or not, requires permission or credit for the sprite. And I know it's supposed to be a joke sprite, but come on, anime stock eyes and mouth on a barely shaded face? The difference in quality of body and head is uncanny. This was one in a long line of many controversies to come about game theory stealing fan art, Something that would have ultimately ended with a slight description change or even a Twitter post. Nothing outright terrible, but a small boo from the crowd of commentators nonetheless. Fast forward to the far off future of January 9th, 2019, and we've got a lawyer getting mad at MatPat's latest video on Fortnite dances. Enter Legal Eagle, a YouTuber who's made a name for himself by being a lawyer and showing how a bee couldn't actually sue in the Supreme Court. In one of these law-based analyses, he looked at those crazy Fortnite dances how they might be illegal due to the copyright since they use dances like the Carlton, and that one dance Turk from Scrubs does. A few days later, Maddie makes a video about a similar topic. Eagle sees this, watches it, and concludes that MatPat just gave him the old one-two, wherein he steals an analysis and doesn't link him in the description. Eagle then takes to the skies, releasing a video about how much of a content thief or MatPat is. The video consists of Eagle taking a clip from his video and showing it next to a clip of MatPat's video and saying, haha, got him. Matt responds to this video in a comment saying that Matt started the video over a week before Legals came out, that they did use lawyers as consultants for this video, that both videos are stating facts of the law so it would be obvious there would be some similarities, and that Legal Eagle is a stupid dummy who shouldn't have made this video. This was one of the more lackluster controversies for me, especially when looking at the video because it just shows that they said something similar, which would happen if two people researched the same thing. Now it would have been different if MatPat said everything Legal Eagle said in the same cadence or with extremely similar word choice, but he mostly just makes outlandish claims based upon the fact that they both made videos on the same topic. Take the example of Grade A Under A's video on interviews being stolen by Ray William Johnson as a clear example of copying. The only way Legal Eagle would be able to prove that Matt's video was based on his would be if a writer came out from the woodwork and showed that he did watch Legal's video. But until then, there's nothing more that can be done besides speculation. Finally, the day of reckoning has come. Fires burn for the soul of MatPat after this monstrous defamation of mankind. The date? January 2nd, 2019. A cool 26 degrees with partly cloudy skies. MatPat decided he was going to stream today. This was the worst decision of his life. The stream started as usual, with each of our hosts shivering with fear due to the impending fallout that was about to take place. Heartbound. The non-traditional role-playing game about a boy, his dog, secrets, and sanity. Matt Pat saw this and was instantly drawn in. A fun time with my wife and the chat. He thought, "What could go wrong?" As we've stated before, Matt Pat likes Undertale so much so that he keeps a pocket copy with him at all times. And if there was ever a non-traditional role-playing game, it would be that one. Maybe since I talk about Undertale a lot, I should relate the game to that, to help the stream get a little bit more views, you know? He moves his hand to type out the title, the dark room only lit by a periodic flash of lightning and the blue light emanating from the screen. The next Undertale game is here. The stream went over pretty well on its airing, but afterwards, the developers of Heartbound were a bit peeved at our boy Matt to say the least. Hey Matt Pat, I'm disgusted and horrified by your blatant neglect of our game and your love of that dumb indie game Undertale. <laughs> Lol, get wrecked scrub weasel. Matt Pat saw and responded with a quick let me explain and threw a few tweets his way with explanations like Your game is cool and I like Undertale so it does make sense. And I mean we don't normally link back the games. 
So don't feel bad, my dude. I guess we could start linking them if you want. Toby Fox, or Mr. Undertale, as he's known by the community, jumps in the conversation with a LMAO, that sucks, bro. Why don't you try harder next time? And gets all the internet points the conversation accumulated. The main criticisms were as follows. One, the title doesn't accurately show the game isn't Undertale. Two, tags don't have enough mentions of Heartbound. Three, no link to the game in the description. So maybe I'm kind of an idiot, but most of these criticisms don't seem like a big deal, or aren't super accurate. Even Pirate's picture detailing the lack of tags regarding Heartbound do show that there is a decent amount of them. There's just a lot of Undertale tags as well. I mean, I don't know if Heartbound had a problem with people comparing them to Undertale and want to distance themselves, but I think MatPat's explanation of this seems pretty fair. Just putting Heartbound in the title and tags would most likely not attract those who don't know anything about the game. Comparing it so heavily to Undertale, however, gives people an idea of what the game is like without even having to show any gameplay of it. Take a look at the marketing for The Outer Worlds, for instance, and you'll see how often it's compared to Fallout New Vegas. Now, to be fair, New Vegas was technically made by Obsidian, but it's actually a Bethesda title, and has many key differences such as it not being purely open world, and it not even having anything to do with the Fallout universe. Now I do believe that you should have put the game's link in the description as courtesy to the developer, but I don't understand how this was the point where MatPat went too far. I mean hopefully he'll start putting links to the games he plays on his live streams in the description, but considering he hasn't put N's DeviantArt link in the description of his Doki video yet, I think it's fair to say that anything can happen. Oh wait he has, alright I guess the problem is solved. When taking a look at what Toby Fox actually said, it wasn't really that much of a call out either. I mean, how has he even gone too far? What was that even supposed to mean? It's almost like he didn't really pay attention to what MatPat actually typed out, and just put in the PR shield defending himself category, then tried to alley-oop on the boy. This really showed that people were kind of looking for a reason to hate MatPat, and one popular guy just regurgitated what every other reply was saying without actually looking at what Matt's defense was, they went, Oh wow, what a call out. MatPat's so screwed now. And just ran with it. If this had happened with really any other YouTuber, people would just glance over it, maybe even think the studio was being a bit whiny. But if it's MatPat, people just see him as the villain. Speaking of villains... Um... Yeah, so the videos on this are like, you know, 20 minutes long, there's also a 15 minute update video, so... I mean, you know, you guys, you guys can just watch those, right? After MatPat exposed the Defy Media scam, public opinion began to switch back in favor of our theoretical cool guy. Not since 2014 has the public perception on MatPat switched for the better, and all of our favorite commentators were sitting pretty talking about more pertinent topics. Like, um, Bill Mayer saying comics are dumb, and, uh, I don't know, Lily Orchard, maybe? Point is, MatPat was in the clear for a bit. He kept doing his thing, making less FNAF stuff, and more videos on different titles, like Benny the Ink Machine, Sonic, Big Tongue Guy, you know, smaller indie titles. At worst, there's a small controversy around his video about Kirby not being a super good guy, which I, as an avid Kirby fan, didn't see a problem with. I mean, most of the reason I liked Kirby was because he was easily tricked, and not necessarily very tactical, which leads to a lot of problems in the game, so... I can see the connection of him being less of a hero, and more of a wild card. Matt addressed this controversy in both a pinned comment and at the beginning of what was going to be the second part of his Kirby video. In both of these, he talked about some of the major problems people had with the video, and actually did a really good job at addressing the stuff people didn't like. He even went as far as to shout out a smaller channel who makes Kirby lore content that criticized Matt's video named Meteors. If you are interested in diving deeper into the depths of Kirby lore, I recommend checking out the channel Meteor. It's spelled Meteors with a Z, but it actually is just pronounced Meteor. He even did this awesome, thoughtful analysis of that last theory, but in a totally fair, non-aggressive, or call-out-y way, which I gotta say, I totally appreciate. He's a small creator who's doing some really great work out there, all dedicated to Kirby and not getting the attention he deserves. Click on over, he's worth the watch. The new video that takes the place of the second part of the Kirby video takes a large pivot from the previous one, no longer discussing the destruction god theory, and taking a lighter approach and talking about how he thinks Kirby can fly from a scientific standpoint. Let's take this in contrast to how he addresses Undertale theory critics in his Gaster video, and how he addresses overall critics in his responding to the haters livestream. Well, he didn't as, almost as cry talking about all the hate he got, instead saying that the video didn't go over well in the Kirby community, he didn't take every critic's word in the worst possible light, actually taking a critic's criticism and deciding to change course based upon it, congratulating and shouting out the critic for making such good points. I mean, he didn't mention pornography a single time, so that's gotta be a plus. Though, a broken clock is still right twice a day, you know. 
Maybe this is just a short moment of clarity, and he'll go back to calling people haters and meanies who hate niceness whenever someone brings up some criticism. Well, dear viewer, I'd like to direct you to Game Theory's video, Addressing Game Theory's Biggest Problem. You see, the Kirby video Matt made didn't only receive criticism from the Kirby community for how it portrayed the lore, it also had one small issue with one piece of box art. Turns out the picture of box art they showed for Kirby Star Allies was actually a piece of fan art mocked up by a guy on Reddit named Cliche Name. This was happening pretty frequently on the Game Theoryverse. So before Matt decided to make a video on Scott Cawthorn accidentally using a piece of fan art in his trailer, he decided to release this video, which discussed the problem Game Theory has with using fan art in their videos as a whole. In the video, Matt is calm and reacts reasonably to all the criticism, understanding why people would be upset and giving tips on what artists should do if they see their work uncredited in a video. He also does a really good job explaining how it can happen, and gives people an insight as to how hard it can be, especially for Game Theory, to know if something is fan art or not. I do have one piece of criticism though. In the video, Matt shows a tweet kind of overreacting to the box art controversy, and makes fun of it in a joking tone as a transition to show how easy it is for this kind of thing to happen. Now look, game theory has never been in the business of making videos that criticize people, and so it's understandable they would make this mistake, but they really should have blurred out the Twitter user's name. Soon after the video was released, people went and attacked the tweeter, forcing them to make a lackluster apology, so much so that a page dedicated to parodying game theory, Game Theory Rejects, tweeted out criticizing Matt for his decision. Overall though, this was an extremely good response to the criticism and quells some of the problems that even I had with MatBat in this issue. Regarding to his MatBat chats, I think they're a great way to touch base with the audience and address something that's on his mind regarding the channel. Even though he has GT Live, more direct videos on the main channel seem like a good way to connect with the folks watching at home, as I think most of the criticism actually stems from a baseline of people thinking of him as more of a corporation and less of an actual person. Matt Pat has had a long and eventful career on YouTube, and that means no short of controversies tickling his soft underbelly. Even from the beginning, with his video on how fast Sonic is, Game Theory almost thrived off the controversial ideas that it put forward. But from the beginning, it almost seemed like he was unable to take the criticism from those controversies in a meaningful way. As someone who's followed him from the beginning, it's an interesting case study to look at the peaks and valleys of not just Matt's channel, but how he looks at the community as a whole. However, unlike most analyses of YouTubers who grow to an immeasurable size and gain a lot of detractors, this one seems to have a happy note to end on. When beginning this video, I assumed I would think all the controversies were nonsense, and that Matt shouldn't have to address them. But after looking into it, I found that most of the issues were actually pretty legitimate, and that, at points, Matt addressed the controversies extremely poorly, falling into the same traps as most creators who think they are too large to think about the criticisms of their seemingly irrelevant fanbase. Surprisingly, I think Matt has broken from that cycle, and started to address criticism in a fair way that helps both him as a creator, and the critic's ability to judge the situation he's in. Hopefully the people who see him as someone who can't take criticism, will see that he has taken great strides to improve that image, and hopefully MatPat will continue down this path of improvement into the foreseeable future. If I could propose a lesson for you viewers at home to take with you from this video, it'd probably be to make sure you don't take someone's actions in the worst possible light just because you don't necessarily like the person. Take what the person has done and ask yourself, would I be as upset if someone I liked did the same thing? But hey, thank you all so much for watching this theory. Love you all smooches, and I will see all you in the next video. Goodbye. Yeah, some days I feel unfazed, like when I'm with my friends with a cut raise. Hey. And on Monday, I got a gun raise. Suicidal to a dime till hump day. Then I go right back at it like an automatic. More drinks, more songs, more beats to rap. I need a shrink, I'm gone. More time keeps passing. No watch, no thoughts at all. Just a